The text this morning is from 1 John chapter 5, starting at verse 10. These are the words of God. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for this opportunity to consider your word. I pray that your spirit would be present and active in our midst this morning today. I pray that this word would be taken and applied to us by your Holy Spirit. We pray, we dare to ask for this, because we ask in the strong name of Jesus. And amen. So we're continuing a short series of messages on covenant life together, what it means to be in community uh, together. And because you can't make a good omelet with rotten eggs, you, it doesn't matter how, uh, how great your kitchen is or how good the, uh, the pots and pans are or how good the recipe is, you need Christians who love God and who are forgiven, who are, who are cleansed, saved, changed by the Holy Spirit of God, and that individual work by, by God in the individual is what makes corporate life possible. It's what it, individual conversion is what makes corporate life even tolerable. Uh, re, remember that in our, our own natural sinful condition, we are all hateful and hating. We would bite and devour each other. And so consequently, God has to do something. God has to intervene in his mercy in order to make it possible for us to live together, even by common grace out in the world. But even uh, as, as we come together in the, in the community of the church, where we are characterized by fervent love for one another, that has to come from somewhere. That has to be given. So I want you to consider your assurance of your salvation in the context of covenant life together. Now, last week, uh, Pastor Toby exhorted you to be prepared to give a reason for the hope that is in you. But whenever you give your testimony, when, whenever you give your testimony like that, you're sure to be cross-examined by somebody, and, and you're going to be asked, how can you be sure? Now, there's two, there are two levels to this. One is, how can you be sure that the objective facts of the Christian gospel are true? How can you be sure that Jesus really was God, that he really did live and, and die, and he really did rise from the dead? How can you be sure that the Christian faith is true? That's one level. Another thing you can say, yeah, I, I was brought up in a Christian setting just like you are. I'm convinced it's true. But how can you be sure that you have a part in it? So there's two, love, there's two questions. One, how do you know that the Christian gospel is true? How do you know that the word of God is true? And that was addressed last week. This week, I want to ask a different question, one layer down. Assuming that the Christian gospel is true, which of course it is, how do you know that you're true? Right? How do you know that you're true? Because the first tenet of the gospel is, everybody get this, we're all false. We're all false. We are false-hearted. And so consequently, God saves false-hearted people out of the world and brings them into his body, into, his, uh, into fellowship with himself. And all these people who were recruited from a world of falsehood have been brought into the community of the truth. And some of us might wonder how much we tracked in. Right? Okay, I lived out in falsehood for such a long time. How do I know that I'm true here? Yeah, I, I was baptized. Yeah, I was converted. I, I had this experience. I'm, I'm here every Sunday singing songs, but how do I know that I'm the real deal? How do I know that I'm truly a Christian? Perhaps some of you sometimes ask yourself these questions, and so this is a question of assurance. Now, in evangelical circles generally, uh, I found this out years ago when I was when I was speaking to young men and women, youth groups, and and uh, people who uh, young men and women who'd grown up in the church. There were two ways that I had where I could make the room go deathly quiet. One is if I started talking about boys and girls, if I started talking about life between the sexes, all of a sudden everybody's really attentive. Right? They're focused. This is what they're thinking about all the time anyway. And now the guy's talking about it. 
So that's one, th one way to get the, the room to go death and quiet. The other way was to start talking about assurance of salvation. How can I know that I'm really a Christian? How can I know that I'm the genuine article? And that would, that would cause the room to go deathly quiet also. Because unfortunately, uh, in popular evangelicalism, we've done a better job teaching young people to doubt than we have done in teaching them to trust, teaching them to believe. They're pretty good at doubting. And a lot of people have grown up in the church saying, oh, back and forth. So I want to see what the Word of God has to say about this subject of personal assurance of salvation. The Christian gospel is true. Jesus is Lord. He died on the cross for our sins. He was buried. He rose again from the dead. He is Lord. He is King. And there are true Christians and false Christians out there in the world. And how do I know which is which? How do I know where I enter into it? Now, you can see from John 3.32 that the Son of God has the testimony, martyria, martyria, we get the word martyr, a martyr is a witness, a martyr is someone who is willing to testify or witness to the truth of the gospel with his own blood. So the Son of God, Jesus himself, has the witness in himself. He has the testimony in John 3.32. The fundamental testimony is the testimony of Christ. When we believe his testimony, we are acknowledging that he speaks the truth. That's in verse 10. So what is the testimony that he gives? Verse 10 of, of uh, chapter 5 here in 1 John. And so what is the testimony that he gives? The testimony that Jesus gives is both objective and subjective. This is the record, martyria. This is the record. This is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and he's done so through his Son. So, if God has given you his son, then he has given you eternal life. He can't give you eternal life without giving you his son, and he can't give you his son without giving you eternal life, because his son is that life. Notice that God's testimony, God's martyria, lands in our inner life. It lands in our inner life. The objective side of it, uh, objective side of all of this, is that all life is in his son. Verse 12. If you have the Son, you therefore have life. If you do not have the Son, you do not have life. Simple. If you have Christ, you have life. If you don't have Christ, you don't have life. If you don't have Christ, all you have is death. You might have Christ's words and have death, but you can't have Christ and have death. These things were written, he says, not so that we might be tormented with uncertainty, but rather so that we might know, and this is the question of assurance, Look at verse 13 there. Rather that we might know, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. God's intention, God's purpose is for normal Christian living to include assurance of salvation. John wrote this letter so that the people receiving the letter would know that they had eternal life. Those of you who believe on the name of the Son of God, those of you who have been baptized, those of you who bear his name that way, need to walk in the assurance that you are Christians, the genuine article. Now, there are two extremes. There are two extremes that we want to guard against. There's always a ditch on both sides of the road. Now, if it's true that not every person baptized in the visible church is saved, and that is manifestly true, then the obvious question becomes, how can we tell the difference between those who truly have the testimony and those who simply say that they do? There are those who have the testimony and those who say they have the testimony. It's a most reasonable question. It really is a reasonable question. But that has not kept many people from doing many unreasonable things with it. It's a reasonable question, but you can do all kinds of unreasonable things with it. The two extremes to avoid are these. One is to assume that if your baptismal papers are in order, then you are automatically in, as though the kingdom of God were like a purebred, purebred line of golden retrievers, or King Charles Spaniels, right? So if you've got your papers, you're okay. If you've got your papers, if some preacher man in the front of the church said certain words over you and put water on you, then you're good. And we've got, we've got photographs, right? we've got pictures. We can prove that you're a Christian in that sense. Well, there's nothing automatic about it. That's one extreme. The other extreme is to flinch whenever sin is mentioned and question your salvation at every little thing. And often, 
ecclesiastical professionals will manipulate, depending on the tradition, depending on the denomination, ecclesiastical professionals will manipulate both tendencies for their own profit. Don't give way to either temptation. In other words, if you're the line of purebred dogs, if you're a thoroughbred dog and that's your idea of a Christian, then who's in charge of the papers? Who keeps the papers? Who stamps the papers? All right, they're in control of this, right? That's one way to manipulate and control people. The other way to manipulate and control them is to say, no, you've got to have a real a real deal, super duper conversion experience, and I'll preach a sermon that makes that unsettles you every third week or so. And and then you'll go, oh, maybe I'm not saved. Maybe I'm not saved. Why are you not saved? Well, because just last Thursday I sinned and I knew that it was a sin and I did it anyway. Where do you think you live? Where, what, what planet are you on? <laughs> How many Christian parents say, I don't know if my little, my little Billy, I'm not sure if he's, he prayed a prayer and he called on the Lord and he's baptized, but just this last week, he told a lie. I don't think he's a Christian. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. Christ came to save sinners. Right? Christ, and he didn't come to save sinners all at once. He, did, he, he uh, definitively justifies us all at once. It's one moment justification. But God doesn't save us and then whisk us out of the world before we can get dirty again. That's not how, that's not how it happens. God deals with you and your sin over the long haul. All right? God deals with you and your sin over the long haul. Judge by the video and not by the snapshot. Don't judge by the snapshot. If you judge by the snapshot, you're, you can condemn everyone in this room. Right? It's not the snapshot. It's the video. And the video is the video of what the Holy Spirit of God is doing in you. And he's doing that in you on the basis of what Christ did on the cross in his death, burial, and resurrection. So don't give way to either temptation. Don't think I'm automatically in because some religious professional told me I'm in. And don't think that you are out simply because some religious professional make, knows how to make you feel guilty. And, and this is oftentimes done with uh, verses taken out of context. In Hebrews, if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, no more sacrifice for sin remains, but, just a fe- but only a fearful expectation of judgment. That's right out of the Bible. I'm quoting the Bible. If we sin willfully, have you ever sinned willfully? After you received the knowledge of the truth? After you became a Christian, did you, have you sinned willfully? After you received the knowledge of the truth? Yes. What, what then? No more sacrifice for sin remains. Uh-oh. But only a fearful expectation of judgment. Double uh-oh. <laughs> now, there are many verses that you can take out of context and you sin willfully after you receive the knowledge of the truth. No more sacrifice for sins remain. But the book of Hebrews was written to people, Christians, who were being tempted to go back to Jerusalem to the blood of bulls and goats. They were being tempted to go back to the temple apparatus. And he's telling them, if you sin willfully by doing that, after you received the knowledge of the truth that Christ died once for all for all for sinners, and you go back to Jerusalem, there's no more sacrifice for sin back where you're going. But what is going to receive you there in Jerusalem, where you're going? Well, 70 AD, Roman armies, fearful expectation of judgment, conflagration. The whole thing is going to burn. You are standing here on the dock, and we're trying to talk you out of getting on that boat because you, in a masterpiece of bad timing, are going back to Jerusalem right before God wipes them out. Fearful expectation of judgment. Now, it's very easy. Just because someone snips something out of the Bible and makes you feel bad doesn't doesn't make it true. So, going back to 1 John 5.13. If we have the Son, if we have eternal life, God wants us to know that we do. God wants us to know that we have eternal life. Before going further... Before I talk about the marks of adoption, how you can tell what you should look for, I want to distinguish between doubts and questions. I want to distinguish between doubts and questions. Doubts are a device that the devil uses to get you to chase your tail. Doubts are unanswerable in principle. You cannot answer a doubt. You can't answer a doubt. You can't answer a question. Questions are reasonable. Doubts are unreasonable. Uh, Doubts are a lunatic operation. Don't pay attention to doubts. Laugh at them and walk away. Questions make you wiser. If you pursue them, if you study, you learn, you grow. 
So the vast difference between doubts and questions. Doubts can never be answered in principle because they're phrased like this. What if, what if, what if you're reading your Bible, minding your own business one morning, you're having a glorious time in your quiet time, and all of a sudden the thought comes to you, what if none of this is true? What if none of this is true? You know how you answer that? <laughs> what if it is? Right? What, if it, what if this isn't true is not a reasonable question. What are you talking about? You're just sowing doubts. You're just throwing things at me for no reason. Questions have answers. They can be posed. They can be posed and answered, and if you follow it out, you learn something. So um, if, you, if you say, what if, what if the Bible's not true? What if the book of Romans is not true? That's a doubt. Laugh at it. Turn away. Don't give it the time of day. If a question arises, why does Paul in, in Romans say that we're saved uh, by faith, apart from works, and James says that, uh, that works justify our faith. Why does James say one thing and Paul says another? Now, that's a question, and depending on where you are in your Christian walk, it's a tough question or a relatively easy question, but it's a question. You can study Paul in Romans and Paul in Galatians and Paul in James and see that in Galatians, Paul and James extend the right hand of fellowship to each other for good reason. They're saying the same thing with the different vocabulary. They're using a different vocabulary, but that's a question. That's a question, not a doubt. Here's the difference. Suppose a happily married woman suddenly has a panic attack out of nowhere. What if my husband is cheating on me? What if my husband is unfaithful? There's no reason for this. It's just a panic, just straight from the devil. The only appropriate answer to this is what if he isn't? What if he isn't? That you have no evidence, you've got no data, you've got, you're just, what if, what if, what if? Anybody can play that game. You should answer with a laugh, what if he isn't? This is quite different from a wife asking, who is the blonde and the red convertible out front, the one who's honking for you? Who is that person? That's a question. I would submit it's a reasonable question. All right. You should answer it. It's a question. Now, you, what I'm saying is that you need to have grounds. You need to have evidence for what you're doing. You can't, just, you can't just get onto a little squirrel cage run in your head and say, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if. That kind of doubting is um, unreasonable. It's irrational. You're using your reason in order to do unreasonable things. What are the biblical marks of rejection? We're not to over-engineer this. This is not complicated. In the context of a biblical community, the burden of proof is, the one, is on the one who wants to exclude himself or on those who would exclude someone. Note two things about a particular way of living. In Galatians, we're told the fruit of the Spirit is like this, the works of the flesh are like this. And Paul says in Galatians 5, when he's talking about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, and the works of the flesh, when he's talking about that, he says the works of the flesh are what? He says they're manifest. The works of the flesh are manifest. Go there quickly. In Galatians 5, it says the works of the flesh are manifest, verse 19 of chapter 5, which are these... Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. People who live in that list, people who live in that list are not going to inherit the kingdom. And he says, it's manifest who's not going to inherit the kingdom. So, I'll, I'll use another illustration here. Let's assume um, two godly churches, uh, both Reformed. One's Reformed Baptist and one is Presbyterian. And they're, the pastors are friends and they, they get along great. But they have different, and they both want to maintain the, the purity of the visible church. They're both, in, both interested in that. There are two different ways of doing it. The Baptists do it one way. The Presbyterians do it the other way. It's like the church, well, don't take this too far. Jesus said the kingdom of God is like, you know, he used thief in the night and unjust judge. And this is like that. The churches are like two really good nightclubs. Okay. I warned you. Two, two really good nightclubs. 
and these nightclubs are quality places. They, they want to keep the they want to keep it a class act. And one is a Baptist nightclub. <laughs> as long as we're trafficking in oxymorons, and the and the other is a Presbyterian nightclub, which is not so much of an oxymoron. So you have these two things. What, are the, what is the difference between them? They don't want fights. They don't want drug deals. They don't want people uh, breaking the law. Well, the Baptist nightclub hires um, tough security. Everybody's ID gets checked at the door twice, right? They've got two layers of security. They don't let you in until they're sure of you. When they're sure of you, they let you in. That's a Baptist approach to keeping this a quality place. The Presbyterian place hires big bouncers, they let anybody in, but if you start acting up, they kick you out. They escort you, they frog march you to the door. So you want to keep out the people who are going to be the riffraff, or you escort off the premises people who are misbehaving. That's th those are two different ways of maintaining the honor and integrity of the Church of Christ. Now, obviously, as a Presbyterian, I prefer the, the you know, all comers, if you want to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and you're not living a scandalous lifestyle, we will bring you into the church and bring you into membership of the church. And if the works of the flesh start becoming manifest, start erupting, then we say, oh, okay, time for you to go. Time for you to be escorted out. So that's the mark of rejection. What are the biblical marks of adoption? What are the biblical marks that you are owned by God? that Christ has put his mark on you. We're supposed to make our calling and election sure, right? 2 Peter 1.10. We're supposed to examine ourselves to see if we're truly in the faith. 2 Corinthians 13.5. Examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. But how can that be done without morbid introspection? Morbid introspection is the kind of thing that says, oh, I sinned, I must not, I must not be a Christian. Or, oh, I... I'm, I failed to be an absolutely perfect person, and therefore I'm not a Christian. That's morbid introspection. And unfortunately, that's what many Christian parents teach their children. Um, Mom, Mommy, Daddy, I love Jesus. I'm not so sure about that. I've seen how you've been talking to your sister lately. I thought I loved Jesus. I, thought, I guess I... I, I I guess I don't love Jesus. I, my parents are wiser than I am on this. And, well, that's your first mistake, kid. <laughs> they're, not, they're not wiser on this. Oftentimes, uh, cr Christian parents are, are really hard on their, their children. They're not inculcating faith. All right, so we want, to, we want to examine ourselves, and we want to ask brutally honest questions about ourselves without giving way to irrational questions about ourselves. You see the difference? Brutally honest questions about yourself, not irrational questions about yourself. So keep, keep in mind you're wanting to avoid morbid introspection and everything that follows. It's not so much what you're looking at as the way you're looking at it. It's not what you're looking at, it's the way you're looking at it. So number one, 1 John 5, 13. We are to believe on the name of Jesus. We are to hold fast, fast to Jesus Christ, Romans 10, 9. This is the foundation of everything else. Do you trust in Jesus? Do you follow Jesus? What do you think of Jesus? Is he a compelling figure? Do you, do you want to hear from him more? Do you follow him? Are you interested in him? Are you interested in what he has to say? Have you committed yourself to Christ? Number one, so hold fast to Jesus. If you hold fast to Jesus, you're holding fast to your salvation. Secondly, and there are a number of places in the Bible where it says things like, this is how we know. If the Bible says, this is how we know, then you should pay attention to that. 1 John 4.13. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. So the spirit is given as a guarantee. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Same thing in 2 Corinthians 5, 5 and 6. The spirit is given to us as an assurance as a down payment, as an earnest payment. How do we know that we have the Spirit? Well, He grows things. The Spirit grows things in our life, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, Ephesians 5, 9, and He also kills things. The Spirit grows the vegetables and He kills the weeds. The Spirit's presence in your life kills the weeds, Romans 8, 13, and the Spirit's presence grows the fruit of the Spirit. 
Also, when God gives you the Spirit as an earnest, as he gives you the Spirit as a guarantee, when you are looking for a house and you say, this is the house we're interested in, you, you put an, earn, an earnest payment down on the house. What that means is if you walk away for no good reason, if you say you committed yourself, you put $5,000 down as an earnest payment on the house. If you just give up on it and walk away, you forfeit the earnest payment. You forfeit the money you put down uh, toward the purchase of the house. That's what the Spirit is in our lives. If God said, oh, never mind with you, <laughs> I'm, done, I'm done trying to save you, but he gave you his Spirit and you go to hell, the Spirit goes with you, which is, of course, absurd. Right? It's absurd. God gives himself. God doesn't give this inner thing, this package called salvation. God gives himself. And when God gives himself, he gives himself, his spirit, as an earnest. And that means you are with him, you're united with him forever and ever. So here's how we know, here's how we know, 1 John 4, 13, that we dwell in him and he in us because he's given us of his spirit. Here's another one in 1 John 3, 14. We know that we've passed from death to life. We know that we've passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. What is your attitude toward those you know love God? You say, I'm not sure. You know, sometimes I wonder if I'm really a Christian. Well, do you know anybody that really is a Christian? Do you know someone who really loves God? And you, yeah, that's a sincere Christian. What do you think of them? Oh, I love being with them. I love being with them. Well, Here's how we know we pass from death to life. We love the brothers. If you love the brothers, if you love the people of God, then you're among the people of God. You, some of you are, were converted in adulthood. You remember how irritating Christians were before you were converted. What a nonstop annoyance they were. They, they would walk into the room and the shape of their head was wrong. So, so, it was just intolerable. And and then you got converted that weekend, and then all of a sudden, all these irritating people turned into wonderful people overnight. What happened? Well, it turns out that you were the one who was not fitting in. You were the one that was out of, out of step. You know that you've passed from death to life because we love the brethren. What's your attitude toward those that you know, that you know love God? Do you want to be with them, or, or are you repelled by them? Here's another one. Matthew 18.3. And said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says that a mark of true conversion is humility of mind, becoming like a little child. Becoming like a little child. And this is one of those places where I think Christians, following the early disciples who were trying to shoo little children away from Jesus, and Jesus was uh, upset with them and said, don't forbid the children from coming to me. Suffer the little children to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. We think that the Christian faith is like a ride at, a ride at Disneyland where you have to be a certain height to participate, certain height and weight to participate. Well, there, if there, anybody has to become like anybody, we have to become more like children. Children don't have to become more like us. We have to become more like children. Jesus says that kind of childlike simplicity and trust is what we should be looking for. Unless you're converted and become that way, then you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. So childlike humility, childlike humility is another mark of real conversion. Here's another one. 1 Peter 2, 2 and 3. As newborn babes, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. If so, be, if so, be ye, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. 1 Peter 2, 2 and 3. A marked characteristic of life, one of the things that tells you that life is present is that hunger is present. In, in Acts chapter 2, when, when there's a great um, movement of the Spirit and thousands of people are converted, it says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. All the people who were converted at Pentecost were born hungry. They're born hungry. That's one of the characteristics of being born alive. If you're born alive, you're born hungry. Now, you, you parents in this room have arranged for all kinds of lessons. You've let, arranged for skating lessons and piano lessons and violin lessons and voice lessons. And, you know, school is just one big lesson after another. But not, not one of you arranged for hungry lessons. No one had to teach their kid to be hungry. 
All right, if, you're born, if the child's born alive, if the child's born alive, they're born hungry. So as newborn babes, it says, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If so, if so be ye have tasted the Lord is gracious. And there's two elements of this. One is every newborn child is born with an instinctive hunger. So how does a baby know that I'm supposed to, you know, I've just arrived in this world. I know nothing except that I need to put something in my mouth. I need to do something about this, and I'm going to be noisy until somebody arranges for that. That's all I know, but I'm going to act on that knowledge, and I'm going to be very noisy until this happens. Well, that's one. That's the instinctive thing. Every newborn Christian is hungry for the Word of God. But then, if you have an older child who's in the process of being weaned and doesn't like being weaned... um, He's tasted that the milk is good. He, he doesn't want to go on to the next thing. He doesn't want to go on to solid food. And Peter says it's the same thing with you. You've tasted, so you've got this instinctive desire for the word of God, and you've also tasted that it's good, and you've gotten adjusted to it. You've gotten, you've gotten used to the kindness that God shows you by feeding, feeding you with his word. Here's another one. For the preaching of the cross, this is 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. So there's two kinds of people, those who are perishing and those who are not perishing. And what is the thing that distinguishes them? Well, is whether or not the cross of Jesus makes any sense to them. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. When someone is declaring the cross of Christ, Christ died for sinners. Christ was crucified for sinners. That either makes sense or it doesn't. If you you see Christ declared with power to be the Savior of the world because he was nailed to a tree, you see that as the power of God. You're among those who are being saved. If you're saying, how on earth will the crucifixion, how on earth does the crucifixion of a Jewish carpenter 2,000 years ago have anything to do with my sin? If it's foolishness, if you're like a Greek philosopher, that's just foolishness, then you're among those who are perishing. So there are two kinds of people, those who are perishing and and to whom the cross makes no sense, and those who are saved to whom it does. Here's the next to last one. And hereby, 1 John 2, 3, and hereby do we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. We know that we know him. There is a difference between how Christians and non-Christians live. True Christians obey God. True Christians obey God. Now, before you get nervous about works righteousness, there's another one coming. But true Christian, there's a distinction between a genuine Christian and a hypocrite, a genuine Christian and a pagan. Hereby, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. So here's another explicit statement of how we know. We know because we obey him. And I want to pair this up with the last point because they, they have to be understood together. Hebrews 12, 6 says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chastiseth, chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. The previous mark should not be clutch, clutched at as in a false perfectionism. True Christians are obedient Christians, and if you're ever disobedient, that's the foundation for uncertainty, Right? We do still sin. We do still stumble. We do still mess up. But what happens then when we do is another mark of true conversion. So if, you, if you're truly converted, your life changes. If you're truly converted to God, your life changes. You become obedient to the words of Christ. That happens. But then you say, but I'm not perfect. I still stumble. I still sin. Yeah, and I say, what happens then? Take, take this... Um, Use this illustration for these two things, walking in obedience and what happens when you disobey. Let's say you were a fish. before, When you were a pagan, you were a pagan fish. And God, by his power, transformed you into a human being. And you're you're taken out of the pond, you're taken out of the lake, and you're put up on dry land, and you're uh, you're now breathing the air. You're walking around as a human being. Now, there's the lake. That's where you used to live. It's the lake of sin. You're up here breathing air. Can you still go down to the beach? Yes. Can you put your feet in? Yes. Can you walk in up to your knees? Yes. 
Can you go swimming? Yes. In the lake of sin? Yes. Can you go back under and live the way you did as a fish? For about a minute and a half. <laughs> That's not your native environment anymore. If you go back to living like a fish, then you always were. You were just a, a fish hauled out of the lake and flopped around on the bottom of the boat for a little bit, and then someone threw you back, but you're still a fish. You still live in that. That's your native environment. But if you are brought out and transformed, and you go back and you try to, you try to live the way you did before, it just doesn't work because you can't get oxygen out of the water the way you used to be able to. You have, you have to be up in the air. So um, King David was guilty of murder. King David was guilty of adultery. And that's taken a header into the pond. That, that's taken a header into the water. That's really bad. Christians can backslide. Christians can backslide. But when Christians backslide, when a genuine Christian backslides, what does the Lord do? The Lord, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, right? And scourgeth every son whom he receives. When, when David confesses his sin in the Psalms, he says, the Lord's hand was heavy on me, dried up all my bones. I, I couldn't handle it. I would, God was dealing with me because he was dealing, me, dealing with me as a true son. But if you just say, oh, it's good to be away from all those Pharisees, you know, it's good, to be, it's good to be back here and you really are relieved to be away from all those Christians, that shows that you never were truly converted. So we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. We also know that we know him because when we disobey his commandments, God spanks us. God spanks his own children. God doesn't spank the neighbor's children. God does not spank the neighbor's children. He spanks his own. That's Hebrews 12, 6. So what is the conclusion of the matter? We are saved by the grace of God in Christ, plus nothing else. We are saved by the grace of God in Jesus Christ, plus nothing else. Your salvation is based on the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. And that salvation is brought home to you when he, at the right hand of the Father, pours out the Holy Spirit, and that Holy Spirit comes to you and quickens you and brings you into new life. That's when you are truly converted to God. You're saved that way. You're saved by the grace of God. Now, knowing that you're saved is a different matter. You don't you don't get saved by knowing that you're saved. What, what happens is God saves you. He just does a unilateral work. He changes you. Excuse me. He changes you, and as he changes you, he, he makes you love the brothers. He gives you a hunger for his word. He gives you a desire to obey his commandments. He spanks you when you disobey his commandments. He works in your life. The Spirit pulls up weeds that are growing in your garden. The Spirit nourishes the plants that he wants to nurture. All of these things are characteristic of true converted people. Now, these, because true, truly converted people love the brothers, we, we seek each other out. We come together in community. And when we come together in community, that community life together is a community that is built around a shared love of Jesus Christ, a shared experience of Jesus Christ. We do not... the. Um, it has been well said the New Testament knows nothing of a solitary Christianity. It's not you being a hermit off in the woods. What you need to do is come together with other people who love God and who are hungry for his word, who love one another, who are willing to submit to the discipline of his spirit and the work of his spirit. Because we know that we're not saved by good works, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Not, you're saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. We're not saved by good works, but we are saved to good works, which is Ephesians 2.10, the next verse. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works, which God prepared beforehand, beforehand for us to do. So our task is to encourage one another, to spur one another on to love and good works. You, you have good works appointed for you this coming week. This coming week, God has things set out for you to do, and your brothers and sisters here are assigned to encourage you to do those things, and you're to encourage them to do those things. You have good works assigned to you, and because we're saved by grace, we don't have, to, we don't have a sword hanging over our heads. We don't have damnation hanging over us. We have been set free. This is the community of the forgiven. This is the community of the forgiven. We have eternal life. If we have eternal life, we can never lose that eternal life. Eter because it's not really a question of, it's not like eternal life is not like a set of car keys 
that you could misplace. It's rather, if you have eternal life, it's more a question of that eternal life, who is Jesus himself having you. Jesus loses nothing. Jesus loses nothing. The, the question is not, can a Christian lose Christ? The question is, can Christ lose a Christian? And the answer to that is no. Gloriously, no. Our Father and gracious God, I pray that as we think about these things, as we meditate on them, as we seek to put them into practice, I, I pray that you would help us to have the kind of assurance that is confident and not proud, not conceited. I pray that our desire to walk with you would be blessed by you, and I pray that you would help us to mature day to day, week to week, month to month, and year to year. I pray that we would all be an encouragement to one another as we do this. Father, as we pray, we would lift up the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying... This table has no blood on it. It's not an altar in that way. We do not crucify our Lord Jesus Christ again here week to week. No, that already happened 2,000 years ago. His blood was shed, and it took away all of your sin. So if not blood and flesh, what do we have? We have bread and we have wine. These are elements of peace. This is not a table of bloody war, but rather of peace. Peace because this table reminds us that all of our sins have been taken away in Christ. He bled, he suffered, and he died. And because of that, we are at peace with God. We only have peace because our Father in heaven looks at us and sees Christ, his perfect Son, who died as a substitute for us. However, in another sense, this is a table for warfare. Paul tells us that when we partake of this meal, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So what does that mean? One thing it means is that this table has been prepared for us in the presence of our enemies. It's a meal of blessing before we go out and do battle, before we go out and preach to the world the death of the Lord Jesus. This is one of the reasons we put the Lord's Supper at the end of our service. It's the climax of our service. If what we do here is warfare, what we did just this morning is warfare, and it is, then of course we need to be strengthened for the battle. For some of you, though, Battle may be the furthest thing from your mind. You came to church this morning, but you barely made it in the door. You're weary from fighting your sin, your flesh, and the devil. Is that you? Are you worn out? Are you beaten down? Is your strength sapped? Then this table's for you. We don't even make you get up and come forward. The elders will serve you. And what a picture that is. Christ is caring for you now. Christ serves you here now. He strengthens you now. So come and be strengthened. Come and be served. Come because you're at peace with God. Come and welcome to Jesus Christ. Father, we are weak and frail people on our own. It's only by your strength that we stand. Grant us strength and joy now as we share this meal together. Thank you for your love towards us and your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. The charge is this. You are in Christ. You're baptized. You've just participated in the Lord's Supper. That's all the assurance you need. Go now into the week and proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Preach the gospel to the nations. Preach it to your neighbor. Love your neighbors. Love your wives. Love your, love your children. Be in Christ this week. Walk in the Spirit. Hear now the benediction. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus, to all generations forever and ever, and amen.